and welcome to Newsmakers, the show that brings together Santa Barbara's top journalists and local political leaders, also known as Hacks and Flax, for inside analysis and behind-the-scenes commentary on the most important news events in our community. I'm your host, Jerry Roberts. Tonight, our all-star panel will talk about the coverage and fallout of these stories. Politics goes micro-local as eight candidates compete to fill out a new city council elected by neighborhood district. School administrators and immigration activists scramble to protect those threatened by Trump's rollback of DACA. City College joins the fight against the federal government's move against undocumented students. And an innovative downtown health clinic opens to help treat mentally ill and addicted street people. Our panel tonight, Josh Molina, political reporter for NewsHawk. Laura Capps, nonprofit consultant and school board member. Brooke Holland, reporter for NewsHawk. And Nick Welsh, the high-powered executive editor of the Santa Barbara Independent. Thank you all for coming. So Josh, we're in the middle of uh, campaigns for uh, district elections, three districts. And when they adopted the district plan, uh, the big argument was it would increase minority representation at City Hall. And with eight candidates in three districts, it's not going to achieve any such thing. What happened to the big idea? It's too early to know if it's going to increase diversity. Uh, this is the second round. And so the first time we did get a uh, Hispanic elected to the city council on the east side, which was a significant deal. And this time, not so much so. There's not a lot of diversity with the candidates. So I think that question, it might be a little early to suggest that it's not working or that it is working because this is only the second time. And it will take some education effort to inform people that you, know, you can run and you can just run in your district. But I think what we are seeing with the, the candidates is part of a bigger issue. It's not really the district election issue, but we're seeing a, an early endorsement process by the Democratic Party, and it's sort of backfiring to some degree. Unintended consequences. You know, they, they got out really early to endorse several candidates. In the 4th District. What's, that's the hot race, the 4th District, which is what, San Roque and Mission Canyon, who knows where it is. <laughs> Downtown. So, and, but they endorsed <laughs> they endorsed Attorney Jim Scafidi very early, and then who got in? Uh, My candidate, Kristen Sedden, got in, and I say that because I'm endorsing her. But she got in a little bit after, uh, a couple months after the endorsement process. Yeah. So what's interesting is when we talk about the people who tend to support diversity in candidates, whether it's uh, gender diversity or racial diversity, the Democratic Party they didn't really go with a diverse slate of candidates in this case. And so it's interesting because Kristen Snedden is running and she's an environmental scientist. Uh, she's a, a mom, she's raised children in the community. She's a teacher at City College. She's done a lot of things in the community and seems to exemplify a, right. lot, a lot of the values that are in sync with the Democratic Party and they didn't back her. So that's a little bit of the intrigue that's going on with this race. Because she got in a little bit later than... And she, they never even and guess what? Uh, women tend to get in later. It's just a fact. Why is that? Oh, yeah. It's, it's because it's... It's an harder. actual fact? It's an actual fact that women tend to, when they're running for office, take a longer time to decide. The average um, time is that they're asked to run seven times before they actually do it. It's just a much different decision. Seven time. times? Yes. Were you asked seven times? Were you? More than that. Seventy times. Excuse really? <laughs> I'll bet. Yeah. <laughs> But it's so, I mean, I do think that that's a significant factor of this, is uh, when it, sometimes minorities and women who aren't necessarily on this track to run for office, it takes longer to get in, and so a, an early endorsement process doesn't then allow for that. But weren't there a couple of women um, who were interested in running um, early on? Kay Parker reportedly had interest in running, but were reportedly discouraged by the party from jumping in. The party had their slate, and this was earlier before, you know, everything was set in stone. Um, and it just seems that even before we had district elections, the Democratic Party was very eager to lunge in, to get their slate set up so that, okay, here's the team, this is who we're supposed to back, and um, it hasn't really been paying off. They, they're just a little too quick off the gun, and. 
They've been doing that even before the district election. Well, you know, we should mention that the other candidate in that race, Jay Higgins, is the head of the planning commission. He's a very strong candidate, and I think, in a sense, you might have uh, Scafidi and uh, 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 Kristen Snedden kind of split that liberal Democratic vote, and I could see Higgins scooting in there. What district do you live in? <laughs> I'm, told, I'm told the third, but I have to fact check that. Um, I don't know. So, and I like think most voters, I don't know what district I live in. That's exactly right. I mean, have, have you received anything from the city that says, oh, yeah. you're in this district? Nothing. Or no? Nothing in my mailbox, no one at my door. And I think, you know, it's going to be low turnout anyway, but that really drives it down because people have no idea. I mean, I suppose they'll, and it's all a, a mail-in ballot. They'll get the mail-in ballot, mm -hmm. have people throw it away. Is it, isn't this early endorsement thing a searing indictment of Duraka Laramore Hall, <laughs> <laughs> former, former head of the, of the party? Uh, I hope you can hang it all on Duraka. I mean, I think he's been very eager to get out front with his, his past. And, um, you know, it's a strategy, and, uh, you know, it just hasn't worked yet. And I have to say, I mean, uh, of all people, Duraka is highly supportive of women candidates running and of people of color running. Uh, I mean, that's, so I, I'm, but, and on the same hand, yeah, most Democratic chairs want to endorse early because it gives the party more relevance. It allows those candidates to have more lead time, to raise more money, to get endorsements, et cetera. So, I mean, I can see, I can see, I can see why the process is the way. And that in it the is. mayor's race, they went out early for Kathy uh, Murillo. Yeah, I mean, your so candidate Hal Conklin <laughs> told me that he was scheduled to meet with the party, uh, and then two weeks b before his meeting, they called him up and said, "Never mind, we've endorsed Kathy." Yeah. Well, to their credit, right? They don't want to just wait until the last minute and then pick somebody. To be successful, you have to start early. You have yep. to start fundraising. You have to clear the field to whatever extent you can. So they don't have a crystal ball. So regardless of whether people take longer to, to jump in or not, it's not necessarily their fault because if this is who they have to choose from, they're going to go with the best candidate they have at that time. But maybe that they should wait, I mean, particularly with district elections. I mean, because who, who knows what candidates are going to emerge out of right. each district. This is a whole new game. And uh, you don't have the sort of broad spectrum of candidates. You have to be geographically specific. So maybe you should just wait a little bit, see, hey, who pops out of this neighborhood? And you know, if they had done that, they would have been able to maybe jump in with um, Kristen Snedden as opposed to with somebody named Scafidi. Yeah, they, they, they're going to learn from this, and they're probably going to wait next time because this is a big gaffe. Who's the new chair of the party? Uh, uh, Gail Teton Landis, a wonderful woman, and uh, who used to be chair of Democratic Women. She's highly regarded. I served on the Women's Commission with her, and consider her a friend. And yeah, I think we'll you know we'll sort of revisit. It. She she pointed out that it wasn't an early endorsement. It's when they do their endorsements. Right. Um, so it wasn't like they upped the schedule. It's when it's always been done. But I think it's one of, to your initial question. We have district elections, so things take time. Things are going to change over time. So. Certainly, they're going to have that conversation next time of, do we want to do a pre-endorsement? Do we want to wait? Do we want to publicly notify, notice people, hey, we're going to be doing endorsements? Get out ahead of it. Because a lot of the candidates, including uh, Jack Usafir, who's running against Greg Hart, you know, claims that he didn't really know until he was tipped off and at the last minute. So I'm sure they're going to learn from this. But what's interesting to me about that race is that the fourth? Yeah, Snedden is getting a lot of endorsements, the kind mm -hmm. of endorsements that typically Well, the Democratic women are the solidly behind her. To the Democratic not, Well, not the Democratic women. Well, the women actual, Democrats. Yeah, the, the leaders. <laughs> leaders. Women leaders. Uh, Senator Hannah Beth Jackson, uh, Supervisor Wolf, Mayor Helene Schneider, uh, it's Kate Parker, president of the uh, school board, myself, Susan Epstein, Galita School Susan Board. Susan Rose. Susan Rose, yep. Yep, there's a lot of excitement for her. She's very impressive. All right, real quickly. So the fourth is, is really the, the most interesting race. Yes. I think that's where you are. In the fifth, you have the only incumbent running, Greg Hart, against Jack Lucifari, who yes. is a, a protege of Mark uh, Jurgensmeyer. Uh, and then in the sixth, uh, I'm sorry, that's the sixth. The fifth, you have Warner McGrew, the former fire chief, uh, running against uh, Friedman, Eric yes. Friedman, former aide to, uh, and yeah. that's a good race. That, that is a good race because yeah. Warner McGrew has incredible name recognition. He's very well liked. He's somebody who's been in the community for a long time. 
And uh, he sort of strikes that kind of moderate moderate chord with a lot of yeah. people. And uh, he's just an easygoing guy that you want to talk to. You feel kind of comfortable talking to but him. Friedman's and, a really smart And he's very fellow. knowledgeable about the issues. The problem he has is that Friedman is, is very formidable. He's very knowledgeable. He's very contemporary in the issues, in the moment. And he's got a young family. He's a working class guy. He's not disconnected. He's not some attorney looking down on right. everybody. He is firmly involved in what's going on in the community. Brooke, regardless of whether you get to vote for council, and I think most of us feel you won't, uh, <laughs> based on your address, uh, and, and it really is emblematic, I think, of a lot of people. You, you will get to vote for mayor. Do you feel you're getting enough coverage of the mayor's race from Josh and from the Independent, or are you really relying on uh, newsmakers um, with JR <laughs> for most of your, for most of your political news so I have to now. to pick sides. Uh, now, what do you think? I mean, it is hard. Let's face it. We don't have a, a uh, strong presence in the, in the, in the daily uh, coverage. Um, I do like watching it on video, I would have to say, interviews one-on-one -on -one for me to hear their voice. And plenty of that on our, <laughs> our website. All right. Uh, Laura, so the clock is ticking on this six-month deadline that Trump gave Congress to either uh, get rid of or fix DACA, which he seems not to understand what, what it has he done because now he's for the program. Right. Um, what's happening here? Uh, first of all, what's DACA and what's happening here locally? Uh, deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals is an initiative of President Obama's, um, which gave um, people who came here as children and have sort of played by the rules, have been in school, uh, the ability to get work permits. So it's just an important clarification. It's not about schooling. That's the California Dream Act, which is very much in place. And this kind of education is what the schools are trying to communicate to our families, and, not, and staff, actually, it's staff and families. Um, because it's, I mean, to say it's an uncertain time for immigrant, some immigrant families is putting it mildly. It's scary. And so immediately, um, uh, President Beebe of Santa Barbara City College and Superintendent Matsuoka of our school, local school district put out statements strongly um, disagreeing with the president's action, which is um, significant to do that, and to send the signal to our families that we stand by them and we're trying to get the information out. So there's uh, know your rights kind of things happening. There's one on Saturday in Santa Barbara. There's been one in Oxnard and Santa Maria to make sure that, that immigrant families know that, um, that they are who, safe. Who's sponsoring the forum? Uh, Cause is a, a leader, and then future leaders of America. Um, but the schools are cooperating and helping to get the information out. Is there certain information that the schools can not provide ICE that would make a difference here? ICE, well, the yeah. The well, we don't. Authorities. So, for example, at the Santa Barbara Unified School District, we don't track if you're documented or not. It's just something that we don't we don't know. We don't need to know. That's not you know the plier versus. Uh, Doe's case in 1982, the Supreme Court declared that every child, no matter of their status, has a right to an education, and that's that's all we need to know. Um, but in terms of, uh, I think you know, older uh, in City College and, and UC, yeah, certainly there's, and, and we've seen what our UC Napolitano has been quite out front with suing yeah. the federal government. Uh, Brookie, but you were out at City College doing some reporting this week on the on the issue. What's going on out there? Yeah, so at City College under AB 540. There's 491 students this fall semester. AB so, 540. So is. undocumented students under law um, can apply for college. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so that's just sem this semester alone. And they had um, how many? Uh, 491. Hmm. And um, so this week they held like a forum of um, they invited everyone to come in and three students who were undocumented kind of spoke behind the stage, all I could hear was their voices, and there was a group of about 60 or so in the auditorium. And they told their personal stories um, briefly, just about how they were feeling um, fear for their family, afraid to answer the door, afraid to go to school, afraid of not knowing where they're going to be put after if they do get um, deported back to Mexico or wherever else they were um, coming from, because it's not just Yeah, Mexico. that was kind of a, a, a scary 
image that you that you painted of they, I mean they were behind yeah. a screen and yeah and just... you could only hear their voices and in their voices they were trembling one hmm. student actually broke down crying when she was telling the story of her father who came when he was 25 left his family at home and then she came over when she was one using her cousin's papers so yeah it was, it was intense. What are your uh, sources in Washington tell you about uh, the chances of of that program being saved. I mean, nobody knows nothing in Washington because it's, so, it's just, the White House is so unpredictable. Right, and to see Speaker Ryan come out and urge the president not to do that, and we'll see, I mean, we'll see. But, but you're right, your intro, the t clock is ticking, and, and you know, to, to, it's, to, to deny um, these kids, these students, um, something in the first place, but to have given it to them and then to take it away, is a, it's, just, it's just tragic, it's so much worse. Although there is an argument to be made. I mean, the, the reason that Obama did this, and he did it by executive action, yes. was because the Congress didn't right. pass any immigration reform. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's an argument that, well, maybe it shouldn't be done by me. I mean, even if they won't pass immigration reform, it really is up to them. It is up to the Congress to take action. It should be the Congress, but we're dealing with this Congress. And there have been cases elsewhere where, where ICE, where the immigration authorities showed up at schools and parents were dropping off their kids. But they, not here, and it's important for, to communicate that. That's never happened here, and we don't anticipate that to happen here. Uh, how about any of your students out there? Is this an issue for them? Is this something that, that you hear a lot of talk about or, or not so much? Well, we're at the beginning of the semester, and so we're doing a lot of reading of con current events. and when we're talking about what news resonates with you in a recent exercise, they all pointed to the LA Times coverage of the issue and them being very touched and uh, impacted by it. Because regardless, I think, of where you stand politically, most people just sort of feel like every child should be entitled to an education and um, families should not be separated. And, you can deal with the politics of it, but when, we're just, when you're sitting next to a real life human being, it would be really hard to look them in the eye and say, you know, you go there. It's just, that just doesn't seem right. So that resonates a lot, I think, with, with, uh, with my students because it's been all over the news. And Jerry Brown signed the Sanctuary State mm -hmm. Bill, um, mm -hmm. which sets down certain restrictions on how law enforcement can or cannot cooperate with ICE, but our sheriff, Bill Brown was vehemently against it. He's head of the State Sheriff's Association. I think that <clears throat> the bill got sort of modified around the edges, so Bill Brown and the Sheriff's Association was never going to come out and support anything. Um, but I think privately and quietly, they can live with this. Um, they're not going to say that, but I think that it, it got filed down enough around the edges that their concerns were, they were okay with it. But Kelsey Brueger, who's on assignment tonight in Spain, uh, the national, your national affairs, she, she had an interesting piece that Santa Barbara is like the 25th, uh, number 25 in the nation uh, about uh, immigration, immigrants who are, are, are picked up in the county jail. Picked up in the county sent. jail. Th that surprise number you? Of course, that would surprise you. I mean, when you think about how small Santa Barbara is compared to a lot of these larger cities and counties, the fact that we would have those kinds of numbers, there, there's reason to question how accurate those numbers are. Um, you know, I remember talking to her about it. She was saying, well, one set of numbers puts you at 25, another set of numbers puts you at something else. Um, this was a study by a university organization. Yeah. I forget. So. It, Brown ha has different numbers, but whatever it is, we sent we deported two hundred people um, uh, from we county Santa jail, Barbara Santa Barbara County, county uh, in two thousand sixteen. So we sent two hundred and fifty three people down to Adelanto, which is an immigration holding facility to the south. Of those uh, from the county jail, of those two hundred were deported. For what offenses? We're still trying to figure out, like how serious are they? Is this you know, you know, a, a DUI, is it multiple DUIs? Is it, you know, what, what's the level of offense? <clears throat> yeah. But yeah, the numbers are startling. What, uh, what's the Board of Trustees doing at City College? Are they going to jump in on this legally? Are they going to file a brief? Or what's, what's your understanding of that situation? I'm told they are going to take legal action on it. 
enjoying San Francisco and what was the other one? Another yeah. county. Another, yeah. <laughs> yeah, up north. To so that they would, what, they would put the weight of our jurisdiction, our mm -hmm. educational jurisdiction behind, behind the suit, which yeah. could go on for years. I mean, it could, it could tie it all up. Yeah, yeah. put the words. But I mean, you're, I mean, the, the bottom line, I mean, it's created this horrible atmosphere. I mean, there's this toxic cloud over the whole nation because, it, you know, it's just fear. But this particular issue is just, it's awful. It's, it's awful, just, which is, yeah, and it's why our school board passed a resolution to declare it safe spaces. We're just trying to do what we can to, to send the signal that our schools should be safe places. And I think, you know, Santa Barbara at least, um, hopefully our leaders and, and our, uh, that families are feeling at least supported and, and hopefully they're getting the information that they need. I mean, the important thing I was told by CAUSE is that people need to um, renew their DACA and not sort of feel defeatist about it, but actually go and get it. So that's what these workshops are about, is helping. And there's uh, funds to help pay for the fees and things like that. Although there's a fear that if you do uh, register, then, then the feds are going to use your information against you mm -hmm. to, to track you down. Yep. It's kind of a no-win. All right, Nick, I used to know the ICC as the Internet, Inter Interstate Commerce Commission, but now we, we have a different ICC in Santa Barbara, the Integrated care clinic. What is that? And why are you so, why, so excited about why, it? Why did I do <laughs> don't, it? Don't, don't miss uh, 2,500 words. Marcel <laughs> Proust length uh, treatment of this issue. Um, what it is, it's, um, it's this tiny little shack in the parking lot of um, the Sanctuary House, which is a... Uh, where, where is it located? It's over on Annapamu Street. And um, it's in it's a tiny little shack. It's um, uh, and it, it's a clinic where you get dental care, dental care, medical care, and mental health care. And the idea is, um, mentally ill people, particularly those on the street, uh, tend to die 25, 28 years earlier than their counterparts who are non mentally ill because of lack of uh, uh, medical treatment. Um, and so this was put together as a, a joint project by um, the Neighborhood Health Clinics and Sanctuary Center. Barry Shore, who I talked to at some length at the Sanctuary Centers, um, said he has these clients who are seriously mentally ill clients. They go to the doctors, and the doctor says, you know, go see your psychiatrist. You know, it's all in your head. And, and you know, it's, and so even doctors who are, you know, there with Sansom, there with whomever, they, you know, people who have mental health issues, particularly mental health coupled with drug addiction issues, I mean, they're very, getting them access and, and care has been a challenge. So, is this free? The services are free? Um, no, I mean, it, it, I guess it is. I mean, it's Medi-Cal recipients. It's, most of the people are on Medi-Cal that show up. Um, I, I don't actually, you know, if, if you show up and say, I don't have it, if you'll get it, I think, Anybody can pretty much get signed up for Medi-Cal at well, this point. Well, we've talked before about the homeless problem that a right. big piece of it is mentally ill people, addicted people on right. the street who take up a lot of, um, who use a lot of the resources that, that are put into quote-unquote homelessness. Is this going to make a big difference? It should help a lot. Um, you know, what's really cool about this is it's downtown Santa Barbara. You don't have to go to the east side. You don't have to go to the west side. It's right downtown Santa Barbara. So uh, it's much more accessible. Uh, and there's somebody there at the door who is an advocate, so is a mental health advocate, who's going to sort of shepherd you through uh, with the dentist, with the doctor, um, and, and, and make it that much easier for you Does to Does the city have people on the street who are no. making street people aware of it? Or, I mean, um, I other than reading your piece, which I'm sure was why I'm sure did. they're all <laughs> picking that up and saying, uh, no. Well, you uh, wrote about yeah, it, too. Yeah. One, one nurse practitioner told me that kind of like word of mouth just spread to friends telling friends, hmm. and that's how she said most of her people she saw found out from it. I mean, and so this, the shelters know about it. Restorative policing knows about it. A lot of the people who are dealing, you know, with this population know this is here. And so, I mean, what's cool about it is, so you have this just sort of in and of itself, but it's also part of sort of a, sort of a broader gathering of awareness um, 
within the community that if uh, treating mentally ill people is really expensive, not treating them is even much more expensive. And so Cottage Hospital, which is sort of the 8,000 pound gorilla of Santa Barbara's medical establishment, has done this sort of big population health initiative over the past two years. Mm -hmm. They've discovered, lo and behold, Santa Barbara has um, a significantly higher depression rates in the state and the federal uh, government says a, a town of our size should have. So they're going to Well, it's just counting this show. I mean, it's just, it's just <laughs> spike up and skyrocket. Yeah. So they are focusing um, a lot of their uh, resources um, now on mental the, health. Uh, State Street, the decline of State Street, big issue in both the mayor's race and the council races, and a lot of talk about homelessness, vagrancy, cracking down on Hill. Uh, Martinez, your candidate, is, uh, is, is on the air with ads about that. Do you feel that there is a sensitivity to the kinds of, uh, uh, aw I mean, uh, awareness of the, of the kinds of issues that Nick is always harping on about, uh, uh, you know, it's not really a vagrancy problem, it's, it's really a mental health problem? I'm quite disappointed in your levity when dealing with the homeless. I'm uh, not being... <laughs> Quote, unquote, homeless. Well. It's not, you know, the, the, it's not a housing issue yes. is my point. It's a mental health issue. It's yeah. an addiction issue. Yeah, That's think, a big, there's a, there are people who, who if, for it's a housing issue, but it's not overall a housing issue. And then there are able-bodied young men who are vagrants with big dogs who are asleep. I think there's widespread recognition that the biggest part of the homeless problem are people who are mentally ill and trying to find a way to help them and transition them off of uh, the streets. There are some who take a hard line, but I think they're the minority, and I think that's one of the reasons why people really appreciate Santa Barbara, because there is, a, and it maybe some <laughs> wouldn't appreciate, but there is a sort of a tolerance of the fact that we do have the chronic panhandlers, but we do have a lot of people who are mentally but ill two, and need help. Two of the candidates, uh, Frank, uh, uh, a Hotchkiss and Unhell are, you know, they're hard lying. We're gonna, you know, yeah, he's some, gonna ban. He's gonna ban homelessness. The rest of the hand, hand, hand. There are some who say that. Yeah, exactly. There are right. some who call it a, you know, a lifestyle choice that, you know, like the. Bottom. That's what he said. Yeah, that's his phrase. Lifestyle homeless. Huh. And, and and people who choose, and if they had other options, they would they would still choose to be homeless. And there are those, but the majority of the people are not those. All right, All right we gotta leave it there. Thanks to tonight's panel, Josh Molina, Laura Caps, Brooke Holland, and Nick Welsh. Thank you for watching, and please visit our new website, newsmakerswithjr.com, where you can check out my regular blog posts on the campaign and politics in Santa Barbara. And also find our special series of interviews with the candidates. Brooke, you'll like that for mayor and district council seats. And so thanks to our director tonight, uh, Oscar De La Renta Gutierrez, uh, to our crew, uh, Andrew, Ryan, and Josue. Our marketing and branding consultant, Maggie Mobucci, our law firm, Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe. And as always, our top ranking, high powered, high energy senior executive producer, Hat Freud. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time on Newsmakers.